there's something about having a studio that uh, is, you know signifies that you're taking yourself seriously. So this studio became the first serious little workspace that you, as an artist, you kind of dream of having. In the early 90s, we outgrew this and built, bought a factory unit, and then we moved on to the current studio where we've been for about 17 years. Kind of a graveyard for works that may or may not have been successful, but uh, uh, sometimes it's hard to throw stuff out. There's been a bit of a trend where, you know, people have wanted to, inverted commas, get into public art. I was try and tell them, just go away and make art for a while, you know, or, you know, or go to art school, you know, for a start, because it's a field ripe for opportunists. And, you know, I suppose good luck to them, but I always feel that if you've got a practice behind you, you're going to be better placed. Some people have described it more like a the plumbers of the art world, people who are tradesmen, you know, who can produce artwork on demand. But it's a hard game to get it right. I uh, first met Tony in uh, 1976. I first started at the Claremont School of Art um, as a student. And Tony, coincidentally, that was his first day, the first um, year of, of teaching at an art school. I think the really important thing about Tony was that, say, he was very eclectic. Um, he had a broad church in terms of his interest. And he was very interested in work which, which went in unexpected places. That's the, the sharpening of the mind is, is equally as important and the imagination is equally important as, as the sharpening of the fingers. I tried to believe that as a, as a teacher of art, you should have a practice. And there are too many teachers of art who don't have a practice. And I just think the practice informs your teaching. And you perform all the actions of an artist then your students are going to believe you. I started out in grade three at uh, Mosman Park Primary School, to tell you the truth. That's my earliest memory of a teacher saying something nice about my art. I don't know how we managed to do so much art at primary school. I think probably because I wasn't that interested in anything else particularly. I taught first at Kent Street High School uh, as a kind of an apprenticeship and then ended up in Collie for five years, back in Mirabuka High School teaching art and then finally into TAFE where I've been since 1976. I first met Tony in 1983 when the then Liberal government decided to close the Claremont School of Art and we discussed how this might be, this closure might be prevented and we decided to get to put together a group of people and form a what we called the Claremont School of Art Foundation, the CSAF, and pressured the government not to close it. And a few years after, we were closed down and I will go to my grave remembering the reason for us being closed down and told we weren't needed anymore. And it was because, quote, we were giving the students too much enrichment. And I have to say, as, as I say, I will go to my grave thinking that because I suspect that it's impossible to give tu uh, students of anything, engineering, maths, architecture, art, too much enrichment. It just, in my view, it's not a possibility. Those are remarkable camps and adventures that they had. 
sculptures made from the materials that they found in um, uh, rubbish tips on, on various properties. They must have been fabulous adventures. I first met Tony in 2003 when I commenced a visual arts course at the Central Institute of Technology. He's absolutely passionate about art and he believes absolutely in the value of art to society. Tony retired from teaching it in 2015 and since then we have been working on public art projects. But Tony also maintains a really strong commitment to his own art practice and exhibiting. We have studios next door to each other and I share a studio with five other artists so he's still surrounded by artists. But he just loves people. It's, um, it's his life, really. My Bridge was the first commission that Tony and I collaborated on. It's a major work. It's 46 metres long. Since then, Tony and I have collaborated on numerous projects and Fold at the Fiona Stanley Hospital was one of those in 2011. That was also the first time that I collaborated not only with Tony but with his son Ben and since then the three of us um, have formed a team and we um, work very closely together uh, these days. We meet weekly and have design meetings and we sort of bounce ideas off each other. We have quite diverse practices so they don't necessarily align aesthetically but I think that really allows us to bring something different to briefs Public art projects have, have become not different, but there's a lot involved these days. There's a lot of computer work, there's virtual modelling, which is, you know, Ben's absolutely fantastic on. I can do a little bit of that myself. I guess sometimes you just meet people in your life and um, you just really hit it off. And, and even with Ben, we just work really well together. We, um, and I think we've produced some, some really great work since we've been a team. <laughs> mission was from the City of Perth to commemorate that the existence of that, to mark the site. And Crawley Vase itself was a wooden framed uh, enclosure with changing rooms and swimming lanes and diving towers and that was quite affectionately remembered by generations of pre-60s people. And we chose the figure of a, a diving woman. We took the model on the basis of some figures that were published around that time of some Olympian swimmers whose physique and form was quite different to what it is now, that she was, they were fairly generous and strong women. After its kind of installation, it quickly became adopted by people in a way that we had never expected. <laughs> and. Uh, and she's been well regarded. She has her own Facebook page and all this sort of thing. So she gets dressed regularly and I don't know who dresses her. I have had people say, you know, that it shouldn't happen to a work of art, but um, I think a public work of art, provided it's not defaced, vandalised or mistreated, um, I think it's fair game now. I, I, it, it worried me to start off with, but it doesn't worry me now. And Ben, you know, our son, who was my our partner in the work, um, we both pretty much share the same attitude to it. Being on the water is a very uh, liberating experience. I, you know, over the years I've got involved in a lot of politics in terms of various causes, especially art politics. It was always great to go out on a boat on the weekend where priorities in your thinking changed and you know you got wrapped up in the wind and the whole uh, uh, the aesthetics of, the, of sailing as well as the physical engagement. Kermak Gower, who was a very personal friend of his, used to go sailing with him. 
Japanese guy, really capable sculptor, and, and to my experience, absolutely fearless. Not aggressive, but absolutely fearless. He, <laughs> Tony invited him on a, a, a night race to Bunbury. It, it turned out to be a pretty terrible night. Great storm and tempest, real kind of Hemingway stuff. And um, afterwards, I ran into a, a Keo, um because he was over here briefly from Melbourne. And I said, <laughs> I said, so how'd it go, Akio? And uh, he looked at me with a very kind of like level expression and a very level voice. He said, Tony scare me very much. <laughs> he danger man. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, if it scared you, pal, it must have been pretty tense. <laughs> I've been sailing for about 50 years. Every couple of weeks, one way or another, we try and go, you know, to make use of the road. I don't race anymore, I always did race. But uh, these days, it's, um, it's just for pleasure, just for relaxation. In the 80s, I went to an exhibition of Tony's work and in the process, I suppose, of preparing to go to that, I looked at all of Tony's work uh, that I had in my collection and I realised that almost every work I had was a work that Tony had given to me. Uh, I'd hardly bought anything of Tony's work. Uh, a few little sculptures for my children, uh, but it, it was quite a, a, a revelation to find that I had a mass of Tony's work, but it was all, nearly all of it was uh, Christmas cards uh, or happy birthday cards, literally dozens. From then on, I started buying things. <laughs> I'm, I'm a huge uh, admirer of Tony's as an artist, a, as a teacher, but as a person, I, I really have him on my list of people I really love. He's uh, incredibly modest, uh, which is, I think, a very attractive characteristic in anyone. He's shy, which is also uh, I find an attractive characteristic. He's kind, he's totally um, generous in the way he has uh, taught people. He's Im immensely caring of his students. I guarantee he remembers every student he's ever had and he's probably had a thousand or m more. Uh, I think he's a, he's a, a generous, lovable, gentle soul. We met at Teachers College fairly early on in the first year and it was pretty carefree in those days and we were doing similar units. So there was, for example, biology where we had to get an insect collection together so we'd go off into the bush and catch insects and, or uh, shells for our shell collection. We both did art. And one of the things we had to do was we had to go and see exhibitions and collect the catalogues. That became a very favourite pursuit of ours. I got in, invited to the education ball by Tony and he was running around collecting em empty bottles to cash in to save the money for the ticket. Because in those days you could cash them in for I think two cents or five cents of an empty bottle or something. So <laughs> that was very touching, very nice. <laughs> Friendship grew and then we both started teaching. Well, we got married in 1968. I remember we were living in Netherlands at the time and I went to Netherlands Library and brought back this book on um, lost wax bronze casting. That was the beginning of it all. We had backyard pouring of bronzes and his students would come over and spend the whole day waiting for the wax to um, melt out and observe the very dramatic pouring of the bronzes. 
And yeah, I think that was a huge marker really, you know, into the something very seductive. So it was small and it was something that could be on a table, but all that's changed so amazingly now that, you know, the big sculptures and public works have taken over. And it's really nice. He does ask for my opinion, which, uh, you know, um, yes, I'm happy to give. <laughs> We've lived in this house since early 1981. This home is now grafted on, or we're grafted onto it through the artwork. We do feel very at home here. I, we, I don't think we could imagine ourselves living anywhere else. When we were looking for a home to move into, this one, you know, spoke to us. Our children were born in the 70s, so they were quite young when they moved here. And, yeah, they're... they're Identity is forged by whatever is um, represented by this house. The home is, you know, it was built in 1913. The nice thing for me is it was built in the year my dad was born. I was born in Adelaide. I've said that on various occasions, quite a disappointment to me because I'd rather have been born in Western Australia <laughs> than I could fully claim my parochial roots. My parents and came from Adelaide when I was one year old. I was their first born, and I have two brothers who were both born here. Dad had just come out of the war. They rented a house down in Cottesloe, right on the beach. And my earliest memories are of the smell of seaweed and, you know, the reef being exposed, and low tides and high tides, things like that. That's about as far back as I go. <laughs> I think I might have been three or four, I can't remember. Dad then built a house on the edge of the river at Chidley Point in Mosman Park. And that, that was in 1950, when I was six, when we moved in and there was nothing around it. Where today it's in crushed with mansions and ours was just a little house that Dad had to run the bricks down the hill through a chute to get to the site. The river was just there as a playground. Well, a lot of the things that inform my artwork these days were very much formed in those days by the river. It was truly carefree. You know, the house was left unlocked. Mum would go to work and we just, in holidays, we had a free run, as long as we came home at night, like the cat. <laughs> I inherited very early on a, a folio of about, about 15 or 16 pen drawings that are quite exquisite and beautifully done, and a few pastels and I think there was the odd watercolour. But I inherited all the pen drawings. Those pen drawings always said that there's, you know, there were other artists in the family and those, you know, that was a kind of an example of someone who loved art and making art. He was an accountant. I never met him. He died in, he, he died before I was born, my dad's father. I guess they served as a beacon for me, you know, without a doubt. That, you know, and for and for the rest of us in the family, really, and also Ashley, my young brother, and my brother Kim, who were all sort of inspired by that little bit of fortuitous genealogy, lineage, whatever you call it. <laughs> my mother exhibited. Uh, skills occasionally that suggested to me that she'd done somewhere in the memory is her saying that she had done illustrations for newspapers or magazines or something like that. She's the sort of mum that would brag about you to other people and then you get embarrassed, you know, <laughs> you know, if you ever did, you know, if you won a little art prize or something like that at school, you know, she encouraged you. 
I think the beauty of our parents was that art wasn't seen as something that we needed to avoid and get a real job or something like that, you know, that if we wanted to do art, then that's what we should do, you know. And, and I, I suppose, luckily, I, I had a teaching job to back it up, but I, I, these days it's more common. I think parents are more supportive, but in those days it was rare. With our family and with Pam and now with, with our kids, Ben and, and Gemma, I mean, you could be accused of pushing people you know, but I don't think we ever have. So I think growing up with art is very indelible in a way. It does, and you can react against it, but they didn't, not yet anyway. I don't think they get too late now. Um, they're locked in. Pam, my wife, has a incredibly important role in the whole family. Pam's influence on the children, you know, as they were young, and, and the kind of uh, backup she's given me. None of this would have been possible without Pam. She does beautiful jewellery. Her jewellery always finds homes amongst discerning collectors. And I love the contrast between Tony's work and Pam's work because Tony's is big and strong and masculine and gutsy, and Pam's work is so tiny and meticulous and beautiful uh, and, and intimate. It was a work to mark the um, place where C.Y. O'Connor took his life, and C.Y. O'Connor was an iconic figure in Western Australian history, and his main achievements were with the Mundaring to Kalgoorlie Goldfields Pipeline, which was subject of a lot of government expenditure, which drew a lot of critical comment from both uh, politicians, and to their disgrace, and, and also the local newspapers also, to their disgrace. The, the pipeline was a very major achievement, as was his work uh, developing the Fremantle port. It was the pipeline that became a, too much of a pressure for him. We didn't try and do a portrait of him. It's an abstraction. He's looking back over his shoulder at the Fremantle port. Uh, he's slightly tense. In, in his kind of demeanour. And the horse is uh, not overly agonised, but has a bit of the Picasso's Guernica horse or something about it. They found his horse in the water alongside his body. That's my understanding. And he had shot himself. Some of the C.Y. O'Connor family members still go down there on C.Y. O'Connor's birthday and put flowers in the water, put flowers on the work. I had to make calculations about tide so that it didn't either get drowned or appear too high out of the water. Yeah, so, so the maquette was quite important. The drawings were very important. And I actually went on drawing after I'd done the work. There's drawings, of, there's C.Y. O'Connor horse and rider drawings, you know, that I've done in the last five or ten years, you know, subsequent to the work, because I just enjoyed the subject. Public art came fairly sharply into focus in the early 90s. I was involved in some of the build-up to it. We got dragged in for various meetings as artists to make contributions. I personally, while I was even talking about it, I really didn't quite know how it was going to blossom or manifest itself or how it was even going to affect me. A percent for art scheme was adopted. A percentage, or one percent nominally at least, is spent on artworks associated with any 
government expenditure on a public building. Could be a school, even a foreshore development, or a public road, or so you see them on the highways. And it's been a feature of arts practice since then, since the early 90s, and it's certainly affected my uh, practice. So, so the, the public art um, phenomenon, which it pretty much is, has uh, really been a, a rock that's underpinned, you know, the aspirations of artists and particularly West Australian artists and West Australian artists who's, you know, because the other states don't all have the same scheme that we have here and some don't have it at all. They do manage to get public artworks done but under various guises. But uh, Western Australia has been very well served and we are grateful. <laughs>